Praise God. All right. Everybody said hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Let's read a passage here. We are continuing our study through the book of Philippians. I'm not doing verse by verse. I'm just uh, picking and choosing verses that appeal to me. Uh, we've looked in chapters 1, 2. Tonight we're looking at chapter 3. Uh, next week we may take a look at chapter 4 and uh, move on to other material. And uh, so it's, it's been a great journey. Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 10 and 11. Philippians chapter 3, 10 and 11. The Bible says, Paul said, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Tonight for a little while, I want to talk to you on the subject of power and pain. God bless you. You can be seated. I think it's uh, normal uh, for believers to want those mountaintop experiences. Uh, we all want the, the power of God. We all want the, the glory of God. We all want the demonstration of the Spirit of the Lord. And, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think we need to see more of the supernatural and more of the miraculous and more of the power of God than in any other time in history. This world needs to see that God Almighty is alive and well in the universe and still has the upper hand and the final say in what goes in with the affairs of man. The world needs to see the power of God. However, if we'll post that scripture back up there, what we will see is that Paul also makes clear that you cannot have the power of God in your life without some accompanying suffering in life. In other words, you can't have one without the other. And for these ministries these unique giftings for these men and women who come through and stand in a pulpit and with a mic in their hand, uh, read your zip codes and your mailing addresses and tell you everything you ever did in your life, you need to know those people have paid a high price for that gifting and that sensitivity to God. You really can't have one without the other. And it's Paul here, he wanted to know God in the power of his spirit, but he also was wide open to also receiving suffering in his life. If suffer, suffering brought Paul to the brink of death, that's what he's saying, that I might that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to be conformable unto his death so that I might by any means get there. Paul saw suffering as nothing more than an end to, or a means to an end, I might say. Um, the, saw, the life that Saul lived the suffering that Saul in, Paul endured was something that he was more than willing to embrace. Both sides of that coin. Because Paul understood that life is temporary. He understood that life as we see it 
is relatively unimportant in comparison with the next life. And so Paul realized that what he really wants and what he really needs and what he's really after is that resurrected life after this life. Now, you need to keep in mind that Paul was a realist. You need to remember that Paul lived at a time when life was extremely cheap. Uh, you might want to know that a third of the population of Rome was made up of slaves. You might remember from history that thousands of animals and gladiators and prisoners and Christians of that day and hour were regularly sacrificed in the Colosseums and the public games. You might also be interested in knowing that during that period in history, the average lifespan ended somewhere in the mid-50s on an average. You might also know that plagues and widespread diseases that killed people by the tens of thousands was rampant throughout Europe and Asia. And then, of course, to beat the ban, Rome was always at war with somebody somewhere, claiming the lives of thousands of victims on the battlefield. So what I'm saying is life was cheap. In Paul's day. And for Paul, it wasn't about this life. It was about the next life. Compared to back then, we get it, we understand it. We have things relatively pretty good. I think the life expectancy now is in the mid-80s for most. We understand that as Americans, generally speaking, we are blessed when compared to the rest of the world, and certainly blessed with how things were in Paul's day. When you think about it, as United States citizens, there are great benefits and advantages. We enjoy the rule of law. We've got a functioning, mostly functioning democracy. We've got cheap Food, we've got modern transportation, we've got great housing, we've got police protection, we've got all things going for us in the day and the hour in which we live. And it certainly would be easy for us to uh, cast all of our attention and all of our affection on this life. Sometimes it's difficult. For us to understand Paul's language and Paul's thinking. How in the world could Paul ever embrace suffering in a positive mindset? And yet, that's exactly what he did. He basically was saying, if suffering speeds me along to my death, and my promised resurrection body. And he's saying, well, let's do this thing. I'm ready. And he was. We've talked about that. Paul was ready. He said, it's not, it's not suffering for me to die. It's suffering for me to stay here with you guys. We talked about that. And so here's Paul. He had lived his entire life as a devout Jew. He attended all the synagogues. He attended all of the feasts and worshiped Yahweh God uh, regularly, consistently, and faithfully on the Sabbath. He followed all of the Mosaic law with what we would call precision, obedience, uh, and reverence for the word of God. Yet it wasn't until Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus that Paul got a rude introduction to the same God he had been trying to serve all of these years. And, and on that Damascus road, Paul was visibly, physically, and emotionally overwhelmed by this sudden introduction to Jesus Christ the mighty God. 
It was a culture shock for him. Now, here's Paul. He was living under the Mosaic law. Paul had his, he had lived by his traditions of his elders. When you think about all Paul had, who then was Saul of Tarsus, all he had before his conversion was a very clear set of 613 Mosaic laws and rites to follow. That was the extent of his relationship with the God of the Jewish people, following and doing the law. But now, after his conversion, Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, now has the privilege of knowing God in a way that was unavailable to him before his conversion. Now what Paul is enjoying, Paul is enjoying this consistent, ongoing, unwavering uh, companionship with his creator. God is his best friend. The Lord is his incomparable master. And Paul, in comparison to the past, is saying, I just can't get close enough to my God and my Savior. Remember, Paul had one time been a persecutor of these same Christians. Now, here is Paul being one of the persecuted by the same kind of people that he used to be in his persecution of Christian Jews. And so now, Paul, nothing matters. The suffering doesn't matter. Why? Because it's getting me closer and closer to Jesus Christ as possible. We think of suffering as persecution. And anybody who tells you that Christians aren't supposed to suffer because we're Christians and we know Jesus, they don't know anything about their Bible. Uh, Job chapter 14 verse 1 says, man that is born of a woman is few, a few days and full of trouble. Job chapter 5 verse 7 says, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You might as well get it in your crawl. You might as well get it settled in your mind that just because you talk in tongues and got baptized in Jesus' name, that does not exclude you from trouble and persecution and suffering. Uh, when you look at this business of trouble is like a fire and the sparks that fly upward is what trouble is in our day. Job was trying to express it. Uh, basically, you are not going to build a wood fire without having some sparks. Right? You're not going to have a wood fire. You can't have the one. Without the other. If you're going to have the heat of the fire, you're going to have to deal with the sparks that jump out on your clothes, you know, and you stomp out in the ground and they're escaping heavenward. You're going to have it. You can't have one without the other. What you need to know is that the amount of sparks flying in the air from a campfire is dependent upon the amount of sap that is in the wood that you happen to be using. Now, I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. A fire made from pine has a lot of sap in it. And when you throw a fresh pine log on a hot fire, you're going to get a snap, crackle, and pop until the cows come home. You know, yet if you were to choose instead dry, seasoned oak, for instance, it will burn just as hot or hotter with fewer sparks and embers. It all depends on what kind of wood that you are using. Job said man is born of trouble as the sparks fly upward. There's going to be trouble. 
There are going to be sparks, but the amount of trouble in your life depends on what you use for fuel. What you sow into your life is what you are going to reap out of your life. And there are people out there, they will lie, cheat, steal, slander, slumber. And those persons are going to have a lot of sparks flying upward because of the fuel they're using. They're going to have trouble with a capital T. But then you're going to have others who try to live kind, gentle, quiet honest lives and they're going to no doubtably uh, in, in live a much richer, more rewarding and pleasant life. Nobody, however, it doesn't matter how good you live or how bad you live, there's going to be some sparks flying upward. There's going to to be some trouble. There's going to be some pain and some problems and some persecutions. That's why Irma Bombeck in her book, she titled it, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, What Am I Doing in the Pits? If you've never read that book, you ought to. It's hilarious. The point is, God has not promised us a life without pain. And it doesn't matter who you are. There's not a preacher, prayer warrior, or participant that is excused from life's pits. Now, if you want the proof of that, you know, I'm just thinking back just the last month or so for myself and my family. There was one day in the month of January that Michelle and I counted up 15 people between her family and my family and the in-laws who were dealing with the COVID virus. 15. I don't think he minds me telling you one day in, in, uh, 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 one day in, well, one day in January, I came home and, and Michelle was in a, in a, um, a fix. Uh, emotionally because it had been a bad day for, for her. And when I sat down and talked with her, I found out that she had been hit with five serious phone calls from either family, friends, or church members who were dealing with life-threatening illnesses and issues. Just, you know, you're just reeling. One day, five phone calls. When we went up to Wisconsin for Christmas. I know he wouldn't mind me telling you this. Um, Joe came home the first day we were there. He came home and his head was reeling. And he told us the story. He said on that day, that day, he had dealt with death, disease, dysfunction, and depression. People wrestling and dealing with these kinds of issues. My point is nobody is exempt from trouble or suffering. Man is a a few days and full of trouble. The bottom line is we live in a broken world and we certainly live in broken bodies. And if you don't think so, you just wait until you are in your 60s. And then you'll see things. uh, It's not quite as fun as it used to be. And I'm not quite as fast and quite as strong as I used to be. Amen? It's the truth. It's the truth. So Paul understood, hey, this life is temporary. We're only here for a short while. In his day, if you made it to your mid-50s, you were an old man. So Paul understood life is temporary. Um, compared to eternity, life is like a vapor or a momentary mist. You see it one minute and it's gone the next. Before you can even figure out where it came from, poof, it's gone. That's the way our lives are in comparison to eternity. James chapter 4 verse 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. 
that appeareth for just a little time, and then it vanisheth away. In Psalms 90, verse 12, we see where um, David, this is in the um, uh, uh, EVS, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So teach us to number our days, to number our days. We're good at numbering our years. If I ask you how old you are, you're going to respond to me, and I hope you'll tell me the truth. You're going to tell me how old you are in years. That's how we count. But that's not the way God counts. And God wants us to learn how to count our days. God wants us to count every day as a blessing, an advantage, a gift. Sometimes we confuse suffering with persecution. You know, sometimes what we call suffering for Jesus is really nothing more than life in a broken, imperfect world. You talk about non-Christians, you talk about unbelievers, you talk about pagans as well as Christians. Everybody suffers loss, disease, death, disappointment, grief. Everybody grows old and dies, including Christians. And so that's not suffering, that's just life. That's the way life is. Paul understood that. Everything in this world is just temporary. We're only here for a little while. The world that matters is the world that to come, that resurrected life and that resurrected body that he was looking for. You know, uh, James talked about life being a vapor. Job talked about numbering our days. You know, and so between those two guys, James and Job, they're saying we need to live for today. Get the most you can out of today. Because James and Job and Paul understood that your life can change like that. They got it. All it takes is one blood test. All it takes is one phone call. All it takes is one drunk driver. All it takes is one doctor's visit. All it takes is one Wall Street crash. And suddenly, everything changes. All bets are off. And that's why Paul is trying to help us understand, and Job is trying to help us understand, live each day for its best. Live each day. Make each day really, really count. You know, God seeks and sustains us in ongoing fellowship with us. I'm, I'm wrapping up here, but this, this is important. This business of every day, all day, God wants us to know that he is there and he wants ongoing fellowship with us each and every day. The Bible tells us in Psalm 86, verse 3, the Bible says, Be merciful unto me, O Lord. I cry unto thee daily. Every day, every day, every day, every day. You know, God wants to fellowship us every day. We get that. Preacher, I pray. I, I have a relationship with God. I read my Bible every day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about learning how to train yourself to remember, remembering that God is both with you and in you every moment of every day. God's not with you just when you are in your prayer closet at daylight. But God goes with you wherever you go, whenever 
you go. God is there. He accompanies us to work. He sits down with us for meals. He abides with us during our family time at night. We need to remember God is there. He's with us and he's also in us. Because sometimes in the busyness of life, we put in our 30, 40 minutes of prayer. We put in our little Bible study for the day. We get that off our plate and we're on to bigger and better things uh, tackling our day. It should not be like that. What we should do is we should remember that when we leave the prayer closet, God goes with us to work. God goes with us to lunch. God goes with us back home. We need to remember that. Uh, He's there for us. And so there's this business, and I want you to really take this to heart. I want this to challenge you as it challenges me. We need to train ourselves to notice, to remember that God is there all day, every day. We don't always remember that. Let me give you four reasons real quick how you can work on this. The first thing you need to do is you need to remember that God is there with you every moment of the day. Uh, we get that. You know, Our relationship with God is completely diametrically opposed to how the Old Testament priesthood lived and worked and worshipped during Moses and the tabernacle in the wilderness. The priests, they had functions that they had to attend to on an everyday basis, like, for instance, uh, refueling the altar of incense that stood in front of the veil separating the holy place from the holiest of holies. There would be priests who would go in and perform that function. And when they left their homes, they would come to the tabernacle where they were closer to God. They would go into the tabernacle and go to the altar of incense. And just beyond on the other side of the veil was the holy presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God that, that lived and dwelt between the cherubim. They were close to God for those first few moments. And then when their task was done, they gathered up their stuff and they walked out of the tabernacle and left God behind. That's the way it was then. But instead of us coming to where God is, God comes to where we are. All the time. Every day. All day. And sometimes we forget that. Just because you don't always feel like speaking in tongues. And just because uh, always you don't feel Holy Ghost goosebumps running up and down your arms doesn't mean that God's not there. And neither does it mean you've got to go get in your prayer closet or get in a Sunday night hot service for you to feel the presence of God or to be where he can talk to you and you can talk to him. You can talk with God and fellowship with God all day long, every day. God hasn't left just because you don't feel his presence. God is there all the time. He's instantly attentive to our needs, our prayers, our problems, our overtures. So we need to remember that. You need to remember that. The second thing that would help you in this business of remembering God is there with me all day long, every day. I don't have to go to church to find him. In fact, he's here with me now. One thing that will help you is if you will turn your thoughts to prayers. Turn your thoughts to prayers. Now, we all get it. We understand. We've got stuff during the course of the day that we're chewing on, working on, thinking about, fretting over, fuming over, trying to fix, trying to take care of, trying to organize, trying to, 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 to uh, master it, trying to overcome it, trying to solve it. We get that. All of us have those kinds of periods through the day where we're thinking about stuff. We're thinking about the kids and their schooling. We're thinking about our employer and that raise. We're thinking about the flat tire on the car back at the house. We're thinking about the mortgage payment that's due in two weeks and we've got more mortgage than we've got budget. 
You know, all these things, they are just racing around in our heads every day, right? Turn those thoughts to prayers. And instead of just thinking about it, why don't you open your mouth or if you're in a busy place, public area, you know, voice it quietly to God in a prayer what it is you're thinking about. And ask God for help and ask God for a solution and ask God for for an answer. Don't worry over it. Pray over it. Everything that comes to your mind that is an impediment, a hindrance, something that's frustrating you, something that's angering you, something that's making you sad, grief, pray about it instead of just Think about it. You'd be surprised. You do that. You train yourself to do that. Do you know what you're doing? You're praying unceasingly. You're praying during the course of the day. You can be there in the middle of the street. You can be occupying your workstation at 10 a.m. You can be standing in line at the grocery store after work. Convert your thoughts to prayers. Get this ongoing dialogue with God. Don't wait till tomorrow morning during your 30-minute prayer time. Instead, talk to God right then and there about it. You need to know God hears your prayers, whether you're in your prayer closet or you're standing in line at Publix. It really doesn't matter. God hears those prayers as easily and equally as if you were at home kneeling by your bedside talking in tongues. Because what God is looking for is the fellowship. Turn your thoughts into prayers. And then number three, listen for a quiet, gentle response from the Lord. Learn to listen. Learn to wait for God to respond in a gentle, quiet voice. Here we are in the middle of the day. There's uh, maybe some bad news. We've uh, heard something that's, uh, that's bringing grief and hurt to us. Maybe we're trying to work on the solution to an ongoing problem. We're struggling in something going on in our life. And instead of just uh, wrestling with it, petition God for it. Uh, clearly, And deliberately tell God what it is that's bothering you, worrying you, frustrating you. Get in a conversation with God about it. God wants you to talk to him, not only about your big decisions, but God also wants to know all about the little stuff. That's going on in your life. When you think about it, um, we're his, we're his children. He is our heavenly father. And when you have little children, you're wanting to know what's going around and around in that little mind of theirs. And so you're, and you're asking questions and you're listening as they talk because you want to know what bothers them, what's worrying them. Maybe they're being bullied at school. Or maybe they're not making high enough marks on their grades. Maybe they're comparing themselves with their peers. Maybe they uh, feel inadequate. We're, we're concerned about those things. And so is your heavenly Father in heaven. He's interested in not just the big stuff that you wait until your 30-minute prayer time to talk to him about, but he's also concerned about all the junk and all of the frustration and all the fears and worries and doubts, things that go through your mind in the course of the day. God wants you to talk to him. Now, here's the deal with that. And the deal is there's a lot of noise out there. You know, with all the noise, all the music, all the commotion, all the demands that life throws at you all day long, there's all this distraction going on, competing, competing for your attention. You've got to remember, God is not going to compete with all those voices. God's not going to shout louder than the music. You need to know that. There's scripture for that. 
You need to know that God is going to speak to you in a still, quiet voice. God is not going to shout over everybody else like a market vendor trying to get your attention. He's not going to do that. He's not going to line up with the rest of stuff in life that's competing for your attention and affection. If you're going to hear the voice of God, it's because you are listening for that voice. It's kind of like you've heard, uh, you've heard people say that, that uh, there's a difference between listening and hearing. Listening is wanting to hear. And so when it comes to God, we have to learn to filter out all the noise and all the other voices and focus on the still small voice of God. And you'd be surprised how often God will drop little things into your spirit or into your mind. God will give you solutions to your problems. God will give you direction for your day. God will help you set your attitude God will help you stop fretting and worry, worrying over junk going on in your life. And so God doesn't want you to meet him once or twice a day behind closed doors. But God wants to meet you every day, all day. And we need to train ourselves to think like that. God wants you to fellowship him throughout the entire course of the day. Why else do you think God would follow you around all day, everywhere you go? And that's exactly what God does. It's because God wants to talk, okay? When God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he meant all day, every day. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You're not going to find God in the prayer room. God says, okay, I'll see you later. I'll meet you back here again at five. God doesn't do that. God is walking out of that prayer room with you. And he's going to go everywhere you go. Might want to give some thought as to where you go. <laughs> because you're taking God with you. Right? Christ in you. The hope of glory. Um, let's stand to our feet. Let me give you one more real quick. We need to work at being grateful and saying thank you throughout the course of the day. You know, we should know this stuff, but we tend to forget it. We get busy and distracted and we're running in a hundred different directions and we just don't have time for God except for our prayer time in the morning. And it shouldn't be that way. Learn to be grateful and thankful. Learn to say thank you, Lord, through the course of the day. When you successfully finish one of your projects at work, right, and you can take a five-minute breather, what's wrong with saying, thank you, Lord, for helping me finish that task? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Because if the truth were known, God helped you get through it. God it provided for you some of the solution that you needed to get through it, you know? When you send your kids off to school, why don't you take a moment and say, thank you, Lord, that they're getting a decent education. You carnal-minded people. Thank the Lord for their education. Thank the Lord that they're healthy. Thank the Lord that God trusted you with them. You know, take a moment. You got an opportunity to thank the Lord for something. Don't miss that opportunity. You can find yourself thanking the Lord every day, all day, about all kinds of stuff. What are you doing? You're dialoguing with God. It's not speaking in tongues in your prayer closet, and I get that. But you need to know that's important to God. And he wants that dialogue. When you sit down for a few minutes of rest and relaxation after hours of work and mental stress, it might be good to just say, thank you, Lord, for helping me get through the day. You need to know God hears that as a prayer, and he honors that. Now, uh, we all understand, this doesn't replace scheduled prayer time. I'm glad you told me all this, Pastor. These four points will help me, uh, uh, help me free up about 30 minutes a day. You know, I won't have to pray. No, that's not what that's about. 
This is not going to replace your scheduled prayer time, but it does help you to fulfill Paul's mandate. And that mandate is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. And you can do that if you will take God with you and honor him and acknowledge him through your day, wherever you go. Let's pray. God, right now, we're grateful, we're thankful for this beautiful group of people. Lord, these people, they know you, they fellowship you. God, I'm thankful that they're involved in daily prayer.